My name is Malik Glee, the Executive Director of Stable and Curator of Interlude. The Krieger Museum and Stable present Interlude, an exhibition featuring 15 artists of the Stable Studios whose works are in conversation with the museum's permanent collection. Interlude, an intervention, intentional interruption, and parcel of a whole reflect this active meeting of modern and contemporary artists. The exhibition expresses the poetics of relation as these artists work with common aesthetic and conceptual interests. These artists meet through their approaches and applications to mirror, respond to, and complement each other. This interlude is a moment in between collective past and future and the present moment of the artist's practice. My name is Kayla Rain Graham, um, and the piece behind me is called uh, Study. I almost said essay because, well, it's called Study for now. Um, and initially, when you asked us to choose a piece in this collection to respond to, um, because I am a text-based artist, at first I was gravitating towards some of the books that they have on collection. Um, but I saw this particular nude and was really drawn to it. Um, in many ways, there's nothing special about this nude. It's um, by Thomas Couture, who's a really academic, maybe even a little boring, <laughs> 19th century painter. Um, it's the kind of pose that he probably would have had students imitate with a model. Um, so it was really easy for me to imagine the woman, the actual model in this painting, um, in the studio. And I just became really interested in her and thinking about how I could use the creation of this piece as a way of interacting with her and interacting with the history of the female nude, um, which really became prevalent in a new way in the 19th century. Um, so that was, that was the initial process. It was surprising. Um, most of my work is process-based, um, and that could mean anything from developing a ritual um, to use to generate text or images. Um, so in this case, I came and I spent um, the whole day with the painting, um, and like I did a small ritual to prepare myself. I meditated. I read cards for the object, which is a fun thing to do, and I wrote. Um, I also did a lot of reading of Thomas Couture. Um, he has a whole work that he wrote on like a, sort of like a primer for how to be a good painter, you know, um, which of course includes all kinds of things about the model um, itself. Like your model will not be a classical aggression heroine, but nonetheless, I'm sure she'll be just fine, things like that. Um, and so what emerged was a text um, out of this dialogue um, that I began writing um, in, in different ways. There, you'll see like one piece um, behind me is mostly text and it's mostly the poem um, with some images. And then the other one at the center of it is um, something called a semiotic square, um, which uh, it, it's like a, a a linguistic way of determining meaning through opposites, right? It's a square, so you start with like life and not life, and then you brainstorm and think about opposites. It's just a fun game. Um, so I made a semiotic square, thinking through ideas of the nude and the history of the portrait versus the history of the landscape. Anyway, I could go on <laughs> a really long time about this, so I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see what can you share a little bit more of the pictorial elements? There's some things that just read as drawing, you know, like, mm -hmm. so a little bit more about the pictorial elements that are included. Yeah, um, so uh, the the painting that I'm responding to, it, you know, she is a nude bathing and there's this deep, um, dark landscape forest behind her. So I knew that I wanted to incorporate trees. And I, I think about trees a lot as metaphor in my work um, as well, like a, a tree is a metaphor 
for narrative, for storytelling. Um, so I knew that I, I wanted to have something of a forest. And so I work with stencils so you can see some trees stenciling behind it. And again, I was also thinking about um, what a portrait is and the history of the portrait as opposed to a landscape. Um, and a portrait in some ways it does, you know, it's not a, it's not a direct representation of something. It's there's a little narrative around it. It's a little bit of a figure. So I was thinking very much about the idea of storytelling. Um, so there are some figures um, in here and the text. And then um, just as a matter of my own practice, I always incorporate elements of um, my daily life, my habitual even boring quotidian life. I'm really interested in that. So when I started these pieces, they were on the floor of my studio. Um, my children come into my studio sometimes. So you can see there are elements <laughs> of drawings done by my oldest child, but then there are also elements of other children that were in the studio space at Stable. Um, so I knew, for example, putting these on the floor that probably they would um, get footprints um, from the children coming in and out. So. Um, I did that intentionally. So some of the composition was determined that way because I came back one day and there was like a little bubble letter over here and a footprint over here. Um, so that's partly how it came about. My name is Aziza Gibson Hunter. And uh, the pieces that are in this exhibition are from a series, a uh, protection series. And um, they were created during the uh, during COVID-19. And when I was thinking about what I could do in the midst of all the chaos and death, I thought, well, I could make pieces around uh, protection. And so these are Grigri's, uh, modern uh, Grigri's, which are African uh, talisman. And they are made of uh, paper, with acrylic, and colored pencil and paper. Kandinsky was uh, very much interested in spirit. And uh, my work tends to lean that way. I also like the freedom and the movement of his work. And uh, the pieces, these pieces are a part of an installation of over a hundred of them. So, uh, and they're um, hung in an undulating kind of form. So they have this sense of freedom and movement about them. And I thought it was a good match. And I'm very interested in the spirit and, and flight. I am interested in flight as a state of consciousness. So I thought that there was a match here. Each of the pieces are named after a different jazz musician. And um, I see jazz as um, a boundless music um, because it, it uh, leans so much on improvisation. And, um, and I think Kandinsky's piece here, it has a jazz-like flavor to it. I, when I uh, was reading, and I'm doing, currently I'm doing a lot of reading about the folk folklore of uh, African Americans. And this issue of flight comes up over and over again. Um, we had stories that we could fly. And uh, many times we're flying away from uh, oppression uh, and physical harm. And uh, because we were, during COVID, we were in a state of being in physical harm. I, I thought, well, if our people had these folklore tales about them being, to, being able to fly, and in that flight find freedom and a sense of agency. I thought, well, that's something that worked for us before, maybe it'll work for us again. And so, um, so that inspired the movement of the pieces, why they undulate on the wall. Each of the pieces have in the back of them different stones and material, plant material that I learned from different uh, um, spiritual people from different um, practices. They gave me lists of things that people use to protect themselves. And so in the back cavity of each of the pieces 
are some of these the small bits of these materials to, again, reinforce the idea of protection. And um, some of the materials, uh, there's rose quartz in them. Uh, there's um, a sage that was from a Native American collective. Uh, there's also turquoise um, and other materials. I am uh, continuing this exploration of flight currently. And they're starting to take even more of a three-dimensional form. Uh, and I, I have a feeling I'm going to be working with this for a while because it's very interesting. And I'm even finding uh, incidences of folk tales on the continent having to do with flight. So now I have a Pan-African kind of viewpoint of this. And um, I think it's going to be an interesting journey. My name's Andy Yoder. The name of the piece is Pile Up, and it's of course refers to the leaf pile, but also um, the history of the Krieger collection because of Mr. Krieger's role as chairman and CEO of Geico Auto Insurance. And I found it fascinating that the, uh, the auto, auto Rex, in a way, provided the resources to build this institution and acquire this artwork. I came up by myself on a beautiful fall day and was walking around outside. I found a magnolia seed pod and thought it was beautiful and picked it up and then decided to start collecting leaves. And then the idea just dropped in. Why not bring the leaf pile inside? Because I admired Philip Johnson's work and knew about the glass house and all his, his, his other projects. And it's about outside and inside flowing together. So I really like the idea of the leaf pile coming inside. I thought it would be placed on a floor somewhere next to a window. Uh, but then as I read um, in the entryway, the, the bio of Mr. Krieger and, and saw that he was chairman and CEO of Geico, then I thought, that's it, that's perfect. I'll, I'll make these leaves out of uh, salvaged auto parts from scrapyards. One of the most sort of magical things about art is the alchemy aspect of it, turning one thing into something else. Um, and I thought of the museum in a way as a, a result of the, um, of, the auto, of the auto accidents that provided the resources to build this beautiful building and acquire these artworks. Materials, it's one of the main reasons I really love sculpture is because I feel like materials give such a voice to, um, to the project. They come so loaded. I really like working with loaded materials. It's very interesting to get something to the point where they stop being just what they are as found objects and hopefully they transform into something else. Um, so it's that balancing act between the narrative they bring to the project and what my ideas are. I also feel like they, um, they make the project, it gives it more depth and it, 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 it makes it more meaningful for me. Hi, I'm Tim Dowd. The piece is called PSJM. And I had an idea to make a planked piece, but it wasn't until the opportunity to respond to a work that I actually started the piece. Um, and one of my real interests is being in dialogue with historical work. So this was a great opportunity for us. And uh, I definitely wanted to be in, in conversation with, with something from the Krieger. I'm as interested in historical context as I am in the kind of trajectory that paintings have. And part of what can happen with a piece of work is they become branded. So they have a historical context but then they operate as a kind of, they operate as a style. And within that, they offer, operate as a brand. So Stuart, or Gene Davis, is very well known for his striped paintings. That's his, that's his whole thing. So what I decided was to look at something equivalently that operates in consumer culture in the same way. So the piece that I chose is a stripe and I'm using a stripe that's a commodified brand. The stripe is actually a brand as my response. And is this brand Paul Smith? The brand is Paul Smith. <laughs>
and it interests me because there, Paul Smith has managed to operate as a brand by just his relationship between the way he makes stripes. And this is the signature stripe. So it's, it's a riff on a couple of things. It uses a historical context, but also uses a kind of popular context too. As I've been making my abstractions, they're always referencing real things. And the more I've thought about the thingness of the, re of the reference, the more I've wanted to make my paintings into things. So when I originally started making the works, I always treated the sides. So there's the kind of presence of paint drips, and it gives a kind of objectness to the pieces. So for me, a logical next step would be actually make an object. So I made this brand <laughs> into a thing. So it actually can be moved and it has a physicality. And there is stripes on the back too. So if someone looks behind the piece, there are very wide stripes. And as you look at the stripes, because you're looking at the stripes at an angle, they reduce. So it almost seems like the same thing that you see in front. And that really helps, right? Because like somebody needs to be invited to look. Yeah. And that's really, because you know what happens with this? If it didn't have the stripes, like you would, there'd be a problem. Like because it would be incomplete since it's an object. I'm gonna make a series of them. So this was the first one. And I just made a second one that went to another show. So it's already out of my space. But I'm actually playing with the widths of the stripes in the front and the back to see what happens with them. So the next one, the, the width's a tiny bit bigger. The thing that's interesting about these is they don't translate in digital images. You probably saw that when you saw the piece. Like, it's too hard to see. So you can't get the impact of the piece at all because the stripes are somewhat dizzying. Like when you see them and you're confronted by it, you're like, whoa. And then that all kind of disappears in a digital image. So it is important that the piece really only functions well when you're in front of it, which I guess is always the problem with painting. <laughs> My name is Matthew Mann. I'm an artist living in Washington, D.C., working in Washington, D.C. for a good long while. Um, the title of my uh, painting is uh, Moonlight Sinew. And um, the way I responded to this invitation was uh, kind of at first thinking it's an embarrassment of riches uh, in terms of a lot of the uh, modern painting tropes that my work kind of like borrows a lot from. Um, and even the building itself, I was interested in um, uh, exhibiting inside of because architecture figures quite, quite a lot into my paintings and the way I kind of structure them visually and so on. David Urban painting right away seemed to uh, have a similar attitude in terms of breaking apart visual language, which is something I think a lot about. Um, in his case, it's quite a bit um, more the brush stroke and different kind of varieties of mark making and um, abstraction. Um, my work tends to borrow those same bits of pictorial language and reassemble them in a little bit of a different manner, borrowing from more representational areas of like Enlightenment era painting and so on. Uh, you know, I used to run away from uh, this term surrealism uh, because it, in my, in my mind, sort of sits somewhere in the, um, in the historical record, at, it sits somewhere like Impressionism sits, like it's calendar art or something like that. But there's a lot of like interesting inquiry I find in surrealism. So if there were like a, uh, a box to put it in, that might be the most appropriate one. E even though I'm using a lot of other visual references like a digital screen space and um, advertising and architecture and things like that, which weren't a either available or weren't in use when the surrealists were kind of operating, so. Yeah, uh, this, Painting is part of a larger group of paintings that um, at a certain point I started to consider landscape as as like a psychological terrain and even the physical landscape kind of bears histories within it, you know. Um, so I started thinking a lot about about that and using that motif 
in a way to kind of express some of those ideas, all of the conflicting narratives and overlapping visual references and different things like that that, that occur historically in the landscape and to this day, I mean, in the city and even in this, this location, you know, it was something else once, you know. So uh, the paintings definitely try and get at um, that kind of dimension of, of landscape and its history and meaning. <laughs>